Yeah, yeah, I'm on it right now. So yeah, so okay. So I, I hold on, I've not started. It's giving me problems here. Hold on. Yeah. One moment. Your event is starting. Okay. We're good. We're live. Okay. So here we stream everything and to remind us, remind we are on the area. So it doesn't dark anything. I just started streaming our research meetings and so it definitely doesn't change anything, but occasionally you have to remember like there's certain things you, you that are confidential or whatever you just don't want to talk about. Or people or things like that. Uh, so the whole idea of the meetup is that as I was saying, we want to cover some brain inspired machine learning topics. So we divide them into, I think, nine or 10 topics, and we'll cover one each month. So I'm not an expert on any of those. So the idea is that we, as a group, discuss a few papers on the field to try and cover the state of the art. So what I did is I got a few surveys and a few papers, and I went through. And then I'm just going to go through that mainly that survey and some other, other stuff I read. But the idea is that whatever I say here is just to spark the discussion. So it's not like me giving a lecture, especially because I'm not an expert on it. So you probably know a lot more than me. <laughs> so please uh, feel free to jump in and correct me or raise something or just come here and talk about anything you want. So what I want to transfer is um, what is continuous learning? How is it defined in the literature? What are the current approaches, the benchmarks? the research directions, and mainly how is this all brain related. So I'm not a neuroscientist, I just started in Menta, so, but there are neuroscientists in the room, and I hope they can point out to how it's brain related and how it's not. So why continuous learning first? And somebody want to take a shot at that, please feel free. And I think it's more related to how the brain learn, how we learn. Right? You just don't throw a thousand photos of cats and dogs to a baby, and then you quiz him, do you know what's a cat, do you know what's a dog? So uh, a, new, a newborn will just get in contact with a lot of dogs before someone goes and puts a label on that and says this is a dog. And by the time someone puts a label on that, he probably already has a concept of what's a dog, he just doesn't know it's called a dog. So that's more or less like we learn. We have all this data coming in, they are from a different tasks, we can say different distributions, different type of stuff. And sometimes we have labels, sometimes we don't. And this, you have this continuous stream of, of data coming in. Yeah, from a neuroscientist point of view, all the years I've been doing this, this wasn't a topic because it's just it's almost like an assumption, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So when people, as soon as I start talking about continuous learning, I'm like, well, what's that? You know, it's like, well, because my brains always do that. So my point is that. It's this sort of assume, assumption <laughs> <laughs> foundation of their brains. It, it sounds like uh, general intelligence or, the, or going in that direction if you're continuously learning and learning. Yeah. You, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't, I mean, unless it's domain specific or something. Mm -hmm. I, I would be <clears throat> maybe even stronger than that. I would say you can't have something that's intelligent if it's not continuously learning. Like, it's almost yeah. like the definition of intelligence is that, you know, you can learn and you're flexible and you keep that's almost like that well, assumption of intelligence. The word yeah. general, you know, yeah, yeah. in many domains. Uh, so yeah. I suppose you could have a continuous learning, but only about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> so the learning itself would be narrow then. Yeah. Could yeah. 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 I mean, there's two things. I think one, if you have like an intelligent system, like a human, for example, like, you know, I, I've learned that you were drinking a beer. It's not that, and I memorized that right now, right? And I knew we left it. And, and that's like, a, you're doing that constantly. You never stop. Right. So if you're going to be have a presence in the world and and you have to remember what you just did, where you went, there's tape up in front of my door right now. I mean, it wasn't there this afternoon, and so that's how you know just to be a sort of a perceptual agent in the world, you have to have continuous learning. But I think isn't there? There's more of a practical problem with today's deep learning networks too, right? It's more like um, they take too long to learn, right? Isn't that part of the problem, or is that not part of the problem? And one one thing is takes too long to learn, and the other is that you can only learn that task. So if you're continuously learning, you're gonna have to learn a lot of different tasks over time, and the system. Is that really true? Can, can you separate out the two? Like yeah. you could just say, "I'm a vision system, and that's all I do," but I'm continuous learning, and it, it's still. So, so in the in the literature, uh, uh, I was going to that. So, how is it defined? So it's defined as a continuous stream of data. Okay, I think that uh, everyone agrees. 
but it can be a new data of the same task, then mm -hmm. you're continuously learning about the weather, or more com commonly is a sequence of tasks, or it tasks, uh, interchangeable tasks, or it can also be multiple pods for the same task, uh -huh. so you might want to learn different pods for doing the same thing. So this thing. is more and longer than it's a general purpose system, it's not just continuously yeah. learning. So th there's these three types of continuous learning, but most of the machine learning literature is focused on here, like, the first one. Uh, the second one, actually. Really? So, yeah, I, I want my, my, my model to learn several different tasks. So that's the definition of continuous learning. So you're like in a reinforcement learning environment, and then you learn how to navigate that environment, then you go to the next environment, and then you have to continue this. It's not transfer learning, where you're taking a learned model and then applying it. No, no, so the main difference between learning. that and transfer learning is that in transfer learning, you only care about the new task. Right. While in right. continuous learning, you want to learn the new task, but not forget the old task. Yeah. So that's that's the main difference between both. So in continuous learning, you have to keep learning on new and new tasks and not forget. So there is this true definition: new data, same task or sequence of tasks. Yeah. Well, it, it seems also odd to me. I feel like this is something that just said things along these lines, where it's like in creating machine learning and AI systems, it seems odd that this wasn't one of the things that they kind of held it to. They didn't seem to be worried about this in the creation of multi-layer perception on deep learning, because you can do, obviously you can you can do continuous learning in those methods, but it, just looking at the way the information is spread out and set up, it's really not. Maybe, it, is that maybe because of the way the benchmarks are set up? I mean, benchmarks, that might be hard to do continuous yeah. learning benchmarks. You know, it's easy to say, here's your data, you know, here's your training data, here's your test data, done, you know, mm -hmm. no continue, you know, so maybe it might be a reflection of that. Yeah, so I've puzzled over this a, a while, like why is it machine learning continuous learning? Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, one of the conclusions I came to, and I wrote a blog post about this, is yeah. that it's due to a very fundamental assumption that underlies 99% of statistics, which mm -hmm. is the IID mm -hmm. assumption. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 right, right. Almost anything that's tractable in statistics, you need to have an IID assumption. Yeah, right, right. And if you don't have that, you can't really derive a lot of the stuff. Yeah. And so the flip side is if you want to mathematically and analytically understand something, you kind of have to assume the IID assumption. Yeah. independent identically distributed, yeah. which yeah. is completely counter to continuous learning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think there's I, I don't think that's the only reason, but I think that's one of the root causes of, of why it just yeah. it just go, go the easiest route. Isn't one of the other reasons a pragmatic one that in the early days of machine learning these things were so slow. I mean, it would take like several weeks to train an MNIST, how can you do continuous learning at all on a machine that takes that long? That's a good yeah. point. Just a limitation. And then another part is like practical applications, I think. I mean, if you have a system that recognizes what's a hot dog and what's not a hot dog, it's actually, I mean, just do, uh, just does one thing, but does one thing very well. And then you can use that and make a product out of it. While if you have a continuous learning system which learns a lot of stuff, but it doesn't learn well, then it can't use very much. You have to have a very good one, and we are. I think useful. also some of the, some of the applications that AI, they needed to verify the performance, and and the people, once you verify the performance, you don't want the system to continue on. And um, you know, do, do you yeah. really want a self-driving car to be continuously learning? I mean, in some ways you do, <laughs> right? Yeah. Some ways you do because you have to adjust to new things that are happening. But on the other hand, you know, it could be a source of losses. Well, they don't you have faith in their memory structure. You can always fine. You can take a trained model and fine tune it on new data. I mean, it's still learning. Right. But, but the thing is, when the distribution changes and it yeah. forgets, so that's what he pointed that's out, right? right. Yeah. Like, so well, we can fine tune, but learning, but yeah, it's not generalizing. Of is, is it going to still know the old data set? I mean, yeah. it, uh, the the idea we have transfer learning is that you fine tune, but then you just forget the old stuff. Then you have to somehow find a way of learning and not forgetting, and that's I think the main challenge here. I think over here, it's yeah, catastrophic, catastrophic, catastrophic yeah. forgetting. That's the main challenge. I would add one more, another challenge just tied to what I was saying is just analytically it's hard to, it's hard to analyze continuous learning systems. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. You mean like math? Mathematically, yeah. yeah. And just the way the information is spread in deep learning system, like theoretically all of the information is spread everywhere in the network. Yeah. So how do you learn something new and spread it everywhere and you're yeah. going to forget something else that exactly. also got spread everywhere, whereas like if you have this part of the network that grows to represent this, this part of the network grows to represent that. And it's not, so, and it also makes it black box. So you see that the learning happened, the, basically the adaptation happened, but right, who's to say? Exactly. So they get worried and they don't want to have continuous, so no, but stop learning now, we're still enough. Because they don't have faith in the memory system.
can also have uh, passive learning versus active learning, right. where you're, you're doing things to decide what to learn next or what to be exposed to next. And yeah, I, I'm so passive, so I think continuous learning that this all has in mind is passive uh -huh. continuous learning. Yeah, there is also active, I'm, I'm actually getting to that. So continuous learning is also called lifelong learning, incremental, my brand in that a lot of them in the literature. And there are r related forms of learning. One of them is active, that Chabi was oh, saying. And the idea of active learning is that you're able to interact with the label collection process, you could say. So you can uh, decide uh, which sample you want the label from in order to maximize your learning. Uh, in practice, we use a lot of active learning, but there's not much discussion of it in the literature. Other related things is online learning. That's just learning, for example, through the stochastic gradient descent. You have few shot learning, and you have curriculum learning. Like so online learning is not the same as continuous learning? Not exactly the same. So what people call online learning is just learning uh, one sample per time. That, that's, that's how that's it's kind of equivalent, though, isn't it? Well, it's not equivalent. I mean, you can do batch learning, continuous learning as well. You can just take a lot of stuff and then... Depending learn. on what you think of as continuous, because if it's a batch, it's kind of not... Yeah, I, I mean, I'm... I'm Going the definition of right, right, right. 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 online yeah. learning, what comes to mind is is A B testing, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. That's active. Right? <laughs> yeah. From the heart. Yeah, that, that's. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, online means that as it's as it's in as it's being deployed, it's also adapting, right? If yeah. it's offline trained, you trained it and then yeah. you deployed it. It's no longer. That's right. I didn't understand the distinction. I thought online learning. Online would be like every time a new sample yeah. comes in, yeah. you, you learn. Well, well that's right. you know, in right. some right. sense, brains don't yeah. like that. They never stop, yeah. right? So, not stopping it seems like the same as continuing. No, so I'm not putting yeah. it as like it's opposite. <laughs> it's just related. So right, right, right. some well, would say online terms, is yeah. like a yeah. subset of continuous learning. So, so is online yeah. like that top bullet point new data same task? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You can yeah. put it there. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, these other things are in addition to online learning, like uh, interchangeable tasks. Is yeah. yeah, that helps, thanks. Well, those are in the paper, in the, in the paper review. Yeah, that's that's so in the, the paper, review paper, yeah, the most of, yeah, I'm just going to that review paper mainly, that's it. So curriculum learning is learning progressively harder tasks. So we do that a lot in reinforcement learning. So you want to make a robot go all the way to the end of a room. You can first, he first learns how to take a step, and then learns how to take three steps, and then learns, learns how to turn. And then you give him a test to go all the way through the room. So that's curriculum learning. Uh, so you have meta learning, which is you learn from uh, meta metadata from uh, previous tasks. So for example, you can uh, come on something from the distribution of previous tasks and use that somehow to guide your learning of the current task. Uh, and transfer learning, we discuss and active learning. So all these are related to continuous learning. They are not actually continuous learning, but they are subsections of it. You can say like that. Uh, just one point, in online learning, as far as I understand it, the sort of similar to taking the batch assumption, the IAD assumption, and they view the batch mode of learning as the gold standard and measure how far you are from that. So it's mm -hmm. sort of seen as an approximation to the batch learning where the batch learning is like the truth, like the ground truth mm -hmm. of the gold standard model. So online learning is a way of, is like, Partially there, are you saying it's like a, I don't, I don't it's seen as an approximation when you huh. cannot do batch learning? Huh. Then how far can how close can you get to the batch? That's my head flips around from what I would have thought. <laughs> That's pretty good from the promise on batch learning. Interesting. But I think it, it's more of a definition of a machine learning word. It's just people yeah. assign concepts to words, it doesn't mean that same word is valid. Like yeah. So, uh, also, the assumption is still there that this. All these tasks are sampled from the same domain. Yeah. Is that assumption really? Well, I, I don't know if that's true for all algorithms. If they all, but I, I think it's a reasonable assumption. I mean, it will become a much more intractable problem if tasks are sampled from <laughs> very different domains. So I don't know. I, I don't think you need that assumption, but probably the algorithms that were developed they have that assumption. I don't know. Or some way of mapping one space onto another space, like if you're moving, like, like you can have like, like for like Nuka can do n-dimensional coordinate space, so that can represent one thing and can represent a different thing. But if you have like very specific data types for a certain domain, then yeah, you have to like handle those types. But you could, you know, depending on the model. Alright, so some of the challenges in the field are ca ca catastrophic forgetting. 
which is basically you learn a task and then you learn a new task and you forget about the old task. It's what happens in transfer learning. So transfer learning, we're actually looking for cat catastrophic forgetting. Uh, how do you handle memories? So one of the ways, uh, one of the approaches to continuous learning we're going to discuss is just keeping a very big replay buffer. So how do you handle that? Do you keep the raw data? Do you keep latent for presentations? Yeah, yeah catastrophic forgetting is kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, that suggests it's like total forgetting. But there's actually, that's a continuum, more or less, you know. Yeah. You learn, you're, when, you're, when you learn anything, you unlearn something else, pretty much. Right, but it shouldn't be like a huge thing. Well, like that's what I say. It's a continuum. Not, it's not, the to read well, the catastrophic it. sounds like it's yeah. fail. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I, don't, I should took it these words, but that seems like a funny worry for it. I guess I'm saying it yeah. just seems like it's right. forgetting. It's What's the difference between forgetting and catastrophic forgetting? And Maybe it should be called <laughs> like this is a official forgetting because I'm learning to do it right. Now, yeah. Know. Maybe the paper altered this one to call attention to the problem. Yeah. <laughs> catastrophic. It seems to get a lack of robustness, though, basically. Like, like, you know, some football player gets hit, and needs to relearn how to read. Like, that would be a catastrophic forgetting, I think. Is it, you forget what you had for dinner last night, that's like normal forgetting. It's like understandable forgetting. But I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying that's not the, that, this is like the least, the least interesting aspect of forgetting. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's more of better to view you know, it, a continuous amount of forgetting. Well, I don't sure. Proper, the optimal sure. amount of forgetting. Well, well yeah, sure. I, I mean, I don't know how the, the deep learning networks fail when they when you do this. I mean, the brain, you forget things, and you don't fail. You you get you may perform poorly. You may have some holes, you know. But it's not like you you stop functioning and you know, walk off a cliff. You know what I'm saying? Um, so there's a gradual brains forget gradually, gracefully. So I, I always assumed that in the deep learning world or in the machine learning world, that this implies that there's not a graceful degradation in performance. Is that not right? Is that well, nowadays, uh, it's not a graceful thing. The worst it's a complete great well, thing. Know, but we are, we're all questioning what that means <laughs> yeah. now, so I'm just double checking my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's, it's not just, normal yeah. forgetting. Normal, yeah. to me, normal forgetting is we we don't, we slowly drift, to, we forget yeah. a few things, you can't remember exactly some details, whatever. Very um, important. Not the but, kind of but, forgetting but, where we're like, hey, let's, maybe you should see that. Yeah, all of a sudden you show a picture of a, a you know, a car and it says, oh, that's a, you know, a, a tree. I mean, not, right. That would be catastrophic. I mean, so I, yeah. that's I always assumed that that's what this meant, that that it didn't feel great. Sounds like to me also. Yeah, I think it's easier to think about this in terms of machine learning tasks. So it's like when you learn a new task which is graded, the accuracy on the old task and the new drops. Instead no. of say dropping down one percent, which is no. high, that would probably. If we train neural networks the way they work, right? And they are, they catastrophically fail completely every time. We almost actually do it by by, by design. We will pass our proper learning, right? Uh -huh. We train it on image nets because that's an easy way to get, right? Uh, we train it on another task, and you cannot do image net anymore, right? It's just completely. But is that but is that a total like batch training system? So, or or I mean, in, in the concept of continuous learning, you, if you continuously, so you start training on a new task, but the question is, how does it degrade? I mean, obviously, if I just so totally, I totally we train the network. I think there's two, two differences, right? One is, in, if you are talking about, I don't know, let's say, a person detector, right? And it's basically the same task, right? And I have new people, new person, a new, new set of that person who will fail or something, right? You, we can uh, do okay by loading new data and basically going back in memory and replaying some of the, so, so, so it doesn't, on the same task, it probably gets a little better, right? It's still very slow, right? Be wrong. Um, I think the I think to me because the failure is the other task is okay. I train it on detecting people, and I want to train. I have images for now for cats, and at the end it cannot detect people anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a new task, right? Mm -hmm. It's a sequence of tasks that mm -hmm. completely failed on the first previous one. Yeah. Um, that's a good definition. So the other challenge is. Uh, detecting distribution of shifts. So we will talk about the current approaches and most of the current approaches then depend on knowing when the task changes. And so there is a lot of research now of you automatically detecting when a task has changed. So that's how the real world is. Nobody's gonna come and say, you know, like, oh, now you have a different problem. You're just gonna have to realize you're in a different scenario and then 
So there's a lot of research going on on how to detect the distribution of shit. So I'm just gonna go over the current approaches real quick, and they are mostly from the review as well. So there is uh, dynamic architecture approaches, and that means changing the neural network architecture. So you can do that in an explicit way. And explicit basically means I'm adding more free parameters and getting, growing the network, a bigger network. So one approach so is called progressive neural networks, is you're just stacking, you, put, you create a new neural network and then you receive input from the old neural network of other tests. So you're just stacking more neural networks. And you have other approaches like you're creating uh, new heads, like new output layers, and you're reusing the future structure for, for the network. So basically you're just getting bigger network or you can increase the layer size. Uh, the problem with that is that it doesn't scale, right? If you have a thousand tasks, you just can't grow such a big network for that. And then you have implicit dynamic architecture changes, which are a lot more interesting. And that means you use the same network, and, but you change the way you use parameters. So for example, if you're doing some work on a sparse neural networks here, and when you have sparse neural networks, that means you have a lot of uh, connections which are not being used. So those connections could potentially be used to learn another task. So you can have the same neural network learn two, three, or even 10 different tasks. So there's a lot of work on that. Uh, another way is uh, changing the forward path. So you have different forward paths for each task using the same neural network. So you could learn several tasks in the same neural network. Um, I think that's a very interesting research direction and one that we might probably look at. Uh, mainly because you can still use the same structure. Of course, there's a limit to how much you can scale, but you can still use the same uh, neural network structure for that. Um, other approaches, does anyone want to does anyone want to comment on that? So EWC would be interested in that degree consolidation? No, so uh, AWC actually would come in under um, regularization. And uh, the idea, so in uh, elastic weight consolidation, what you're doing is you're constraining the most important, so you, you learn a task, mm -hmm. and then you constrain the most important weights when you're learning a new task, so you don't change them a lot. So it's a sort of regularization. So it falls under the bucket of regularization approaches. So using some sort of constraints or penalties in order to avoid your most important weights of, uh, of being changed. But they are still changing a little. Even using the AWC, they're still changing a little. The dynamic architecture is, is the idea that you use some sort of mask or you, you can use the same network to learn uh, several tasks, but you just use different edges or different neurons or different forward paths, but within the same network. So that's the idea there. Uh, dual architecture is that you have two networks. So you have a slow learner and a fast learner. So if anyone here has played with reinforcement learning, that's a double DQN. So the idea is that you have a fast learner who is, so they're related to brain research, and I think that's the whole idea we do here. So the, the fast network could be the hippocampus who is um, so storing a short-term memory and it's learning fast, and the slow learner would be the neocortex. And then from time to time, you get whatever you learn in the fast learner, and you move to the slow learner. So the slow learner is the one consolidating learning from several tasks, while the fast learner is getting the inputs and learning uh, online. So there are a lot of approaches using two architectures, and there are approaches using three architectures, and one of them is deciding when to use the slow learner and when to use the fast learner. So that's one way of attacking the problem. The, you said that the one is the slow, it's like the cortex, the other one like the hippocampus. Those models are still multi-layer perceptron based? Are there different kinds of? Well, they, they can be. Uh, Maybe CNNs, if we're handling images, uh -huh. but they're neural right. networks, yeah. Right, so right. both uh -huh. models are, are neural networks. Okay, I figured so, yeah. I think you, are, you, you have two models, one is learning very fast, and at one time to time, you just consolidate that into a slow learner. And the slow mm -hmm. learning is mm -hmm. taking yeah. the knowledge of all that. Okay. So you're not, so you're still learning the same way with the fast one, but then you're just migrating a part of it to the slow learner. So you're not having some catastrophic. It sounds like they're like injecting things that sound to me like spatial pooling and temporal pooling. <laughs> Like by saying, okay, you, you neurons and you synapses basically are responsible for looking at this part of the distribution because you're only going to respond when this fires, so we won't, again, have everything spread mm -hmm. everywhere. You know what I mean? As opposed to these sort of like not having everything be involved in everything. Well, it's just two separate systems, really, yeah. right? Yeah, in this case, it would be like two separate, two separate yeah. neural networks. Yeah, yeah. By the way, the latest, uh, latest you know, several years ago, 
uh, brain research, is that people used to think that the short-term memories were transferred to the neocortex. But it doesn't appear to be that. It's never made sense to me. You, you can't transfer memories in the brain. But it looks like the, the neocortex is just learning slowly, and it's learning in simultaneously with the, um, uh, with the hippocampus. And for some reason, if you remove the hippocampus, then the, the neocortex stops learning that. Uh, it's that there is no in the brain, there's no transfer. It's, yeah. it's, there are two networks running at different rates. So I think, I think this work is still based on the idea of transfer. So yeah. when they, uh, I read a paper in it and they refer a lot to neuroscience literature, but yeah. they, I think they're referring to this idea of Yeah, I understand that idea has been discredited now, but I don't see, it seems more elegant to me anyway to have just, just two systems that are learning at different rates. And, yeah. um, when you talk about the third system, is that also brain inspired or? That's also, that's a network called, I think, FearNet. And um, basically, this third network is deciding when I'm going, when do I need the fast learner, and when should I uh, use the slow learning information? But the brain does not function like that. Right? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I would think not. Maybe. I would think not. Yeah, but I mean, the fast learner is always learning. That's it. You know, I, yeah. I remember that you were drinking a beer. And now I don't know what a beer with. But. <laughs> you know, that's always it's catastrophic for you. Know, Here's my beer. You know, I remember Matt was talking for a moment ago about his laptop being too slow. You know, that's stuff that I will not remember a week from now. Right? So this is this really fast, constant learning, constant learning, constant learning, and then there's a slower system that if I see if I see you every day with a beer in your hand, then I'll start learning that that's what you always have. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to worry about my job, right? <laughs> <laughs> See that could that could involve the catastrophic catastrophic <laughs> reaction there. But did you understand how the transfer actually works? Like how is that implemented from the, the uh, so I I can tell in WQN yeah. uh, that's what I have experience in. So in WQN you basically transfer the entire network. So yeah. just copy all the weights. Yeah. <laughs> but but in the way you have you are on the same task. So if, but if you have a lot of tasks, then you would have at least to do some kind of you know moving average, some probably some kind of knowledge distillation. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So yeah, I, I guess it's some sort of knowledge distillation. But so in, in knowledge distillation, you have uh, one network learns one network learns A, and you want to transfer that knowledge to another network. So you you make the other um, network learn the output of the previous network, like the, let's say, the, the last hidden layer. So it's like a soft target. And it can learn a lot faster than learning from the actual samples. So you are distilling the knowledge from network A to network B. And you're stacking another piece of hierarchy on top of an existing network, uh, assuming that it's um, No, you're actually... It's not even a network function. It's just like a, it sounds like it's just like a, you know, raw computing function. The, the, the knowledge installation? Yeah, no, the, the first one I described is just is just copying. But the knowledge installation, like oh. you're giving a target, but the tar the target is not the actual target. So the target is to learn the same representation the other network learned. So that's why it's called like a sub target. So that's the whole idea between knowledge installation. Like instead of uh, learning from the same data than network uh, A learning, you have to learn from a sub target. And I'm, it's just my guess that I I don't know how they're doing the transfer from the logic. I mean I don't know. I haven't read the paper. <laughs> Someone has this. <laughs> and um, the dual architecture papers. I, how the how how you transfer? You just copy the weight. You just copy. Yeah, yeah. double can you just copy the weight. But I mean, if you have like several tasks, there might be like a smaller. So there are neural networks like this. So you have two parallel neural networks. So the first one learns the higher representation. Maybe if you have animals, maybe the one is learning what what's the exact animal, dog or a cat. The the parallel one will be giving some feedbacks in between to help uh, the, to the final decision. Yeah. Thanks. If you just transfer the weights, does that mean that the networks have to be the same architecture of them? Yeah. 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 In double how, how do you copy the weights without destroying the what we previously learned? You destroy it. It's twice. Uh, that's why I said it has to be the same task. I mean, in WQN, it has to be the same task. But if you're learning several tasks, then you need a more smarter way of not destroying whatever you have to. But uh, maybe WQN. That wouldn't be continuous learning. Anyway, right? so that wouldn't be continuous learning. Yeah. Yeah. 
Maybe that would be good as a bad example. It seemed like just like a way of just copying your network and then making a new one and copying it so you just end up a whole bunch of other networks. Well, you're copying your weights, but you're not copying the gradients and all that, I suppose, that are cached when you do forward and backward propagation. Well, but the, the gradients are you discarded. Did, you right? did carry the weights, but you don't have well, the learning. But the, the, but the whole learning is on the, the weights. Yeah. Does the slow network learn at all, or is it just receiving? It's so just with, I think the idea here is just <laughs> That's a really slow. It really doesn't look about it. It's not learning at all. It really doesn't look about it. Yeah, it really like some kind of memory, but uh, uh, not a direct memory. It's really like a checkpoint of your own network. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, in WKN, yeah, but then I'm assuming there is a more advanced one <laughs> in which it's some kind of memory. But that's a good question. I don't have the answer to it. Yeah, no, that's okay. Well, it is kind of a cheaty way of making continuous learning, right? Just checkpoint. Good new task, checkpoint. <laughs> I mean, there, there's a smoother way of, of doing this, right? You, you can also um, kind of have two networks, and then the one is keeping an exponential moving average of the network weights of, of, the, of the fast learner. Um, and then you basically have this, so it's called polyac averaging. And then I'm, I'm not sure if you can actually apply it to these tasks, but that's kind of the, um, it's, it's less aggressive than copying the weights, right? Instead of copying the weights, you update the weights to be an average of the new fast learner weights and the old weights, and mm -hmm. then you basically have a parameter. And if you set that parameter to one, you, you have this copy. So, so, so there's no learner is a moving average of the fast learner. That's more or less. No different. I mean, the slow learners updated uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. The file, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so that's a smart fit. <laughs> would, would that work? I mean, you, you, are you gonna are you gonna average all the weights the same and all that? Just a bunch of weights. So, so, so what what you essentially do at, at each time step is you, um, co I mean, you 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 basically compute an average of the old weights, um, and the new fast learner weights using all some mixing all constant. The every yeah. Weight? So every every weight. And then you basically have one parameter where you can specify, um, I don't know, maybe you, you want to keep 90% of the old weights plus 10% of the new weights. And then in, in general, the network you learn from that um, has a better performance in the end than the one network alone. Hmm. So yeah, that's, that, that's a good way of doing it. But I'm sure there are probably a lot, lots of ways of doing it. Um. Can I go back to the implicit? Yeah, yeah, advantage? please. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you said that uh, using the sparse networks mm -hmm. with different connections, you can encode different tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, does it harm uh, the robustness of individual tasks? Because if you That's kind of question. interpret uh, what dropout does, is basically create these redundant parts. Mm -hmm. And now you are saying, OK, don't use the redundant parts, but each of these parts are encoding different tasks. So um, that, that is a good question. <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, this is in reference to the stuff that we were yeah. doing in our sparse. Yeah, we wouldn't use dropout because dropout is a very random brute force way of, of killing things. So, but this would be the sparse weights would be very specific to the tasks that are learned. And, and um, when you learn new tasks, you would have a new set of sparse weights for that. And the key is that with sparse weights, they don't collide with one another. Yeah, and dropout, we're actually learning an ensemble, right? So you're learning like a bunch of neural networks, of yeah, sparse neural networks. So the work we are doing, you're just learning one sparse neural network. So you, so you have like a lot of capacity that you could yeah. use to learn other networks. But what he's saying is that uh, with dropout, the whole point is to build in redundancy. Yeah. So yeah. And this, this, and this is the exact point. opposite where you don't want to, like you want to. No, no, yeah. it turns out uh, if you do the sparse weights correctly without dropout, you get, you get very high redundancy. You get really high fault tolerance. So it's, with, it's the quite yeah. hmm? uh, with the same architecture, with the same architecture, is the sparse and the dense architecture still the same? And just the learning? No, no, these are sparse change. architectures. There's no density. But it's yeah. a, the same number of layers. Yeah, yeah. Same, yeah same, same number layers. of layers. Well, but it's just the connections that uh, are sparse over yeah. time, and only the the strong connections remain. Yeah, for any given kind of pattern or input, you would learn a very sparse path through the network. Are you also yeah. assuming you're uh, a sparse activation mm -hmm. in the neurons or not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no. but, that, but it's only one sparse path. While in dropout, mm -hmm. we're learning several sparse yeah. paths, and you're having an ensemble of those. So, so and this is very much, since it's uh, going back to brain inspired, this is very much how the brain learns. The brain is extremely sparse mm -hmm. in activity. Mm -hmm. it's like 
two, you know, often way less than a couple of, uh, percent of active neurons. And then the connectivity is also extremely sparse. Mm -hmm. A very few percentage of all possible connections actually are there. And then when we learn new things, we're actually growing new connections and new sort of clusters of synapses all the time. But I recently read somewhere that, I mean, I just have the summary of a paper which said that it's not even deterministic. Like for the same input, it's a sparse firing pattern, but you might have a different pattern for the same input at a different time. So there's some sort of, like I, I yeah, don't know. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There's some of that because uh, one, there might be noise in the input. And so you get slight changes, but also neurons are not that reliable, and so and synapses are not that reliable. So you, some of them just might fail to fire, and it would just change. And some of it's also just we are very the brain is very contextual. So the context changes, mm -hmm. even just if it's later in the experiment, then you know, the con it's a different context for the animal or for us, and so just different things will fire. Yeah. You you have some work. I mean, I think I, I put in the meetup by uh, Bruno from. Uh, Redwood uh, Institute, and so he's using the same set of weights and decomposing that. So uh, using context, he decomposed that into several different neural networks, and one of them is used for each test. I could do like in a Fourier series, you decompose the sign into uh, several mm -hmm. sigmoids, or so that's that's the general idea he's uh, he's following. I thought it's very interesting. So you can have the same set of weights and use them to learn uh, a lot of tasks. You just need this context that you know you multiply the weight by this context, and then you have like a, a different set of weights. And that's another way of doing implicit um, dynamic architecture. So there, there are several ways. I think that's a very interesting one because we we don't grow the network, right? And there are other two ways of doing that: uh, re rehearse replay and generative replay. So rehearse replay is just you keep the memory. That's it. Right? So we do that a lot in reinforcement learning. And you just keep the memory of past transitions, and then there are smart ways of keeping that, of prioritizing, and then you replay them from time to time. So you start to forget that, you just grab that memory and replay to the network, and then you The memory it. being the training sequence? What's the memory? Yeah, the, the, the memory being the, the, the sample, the yeah. input and yeah, the yeah, label, yeah, yeah. or in reinforcement learning is the transition. Yeah. How, do you, how do you know what you forgot? What do you forget? Yeah. So in, in prioritized experience, so in experience replay, the idea is that you keep the memories. So there is this notion of prioritized experience replay that every time you sample from your batch and you use that batch uh, to learn, right? And then you calculate the temporal difference error, which is kind of a measure of surprise. So if, it, if those experiences have a big impact in your network, it means you haven't learned, so you keep those in the buffer. But if they have a low impact, it means you already learned, so you can just discard them. So you're actually prioritizing them by surprise. So, so every time you remember that, and you wow, that actually happened, then you still <laughs> keep those in the memory. And some memories, you would keep them forever. Let's say if you see a flying horse, you never forget the flying horse. <laughs> so that, that's the idea of experience replay. And now we have a generative replay, which is a really cool as well, and the idea of generic replay is that you learn a model of the world, and then you generate a replay, and you learn from that generated replay. So you can do that in reinforcement learning, for example, model based, where you learn the transitions, and you can generate the transitions, so you don't have to keep the memory, you just have to keep this generative model, and you can do that in supervised learning as well. So it seems like there's a catch-22 there, because the generative model also has to be so how do you avoid catastrophic forgetting the generative model? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like you're pushing the problem one step down. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, 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 that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. But yeah, there is a catch in it. That's why it's continuous. It's not, a, it's not catastrophic or not. It's not a zero, one thing. Well, the, the model of the world you're learning would be a lot bigger than that. The model, the actual learning model, the mm -hmm. model which is learning your policy, for example, in reinforcement learning. Because then, if you learn a huge model of the world, you can uh, use that to generate the samples, and then your smaller network, which is uh, learning a policy, mm -hmm. you can use those to learn. So, you'd need a uh, dual, dual kind of architecture. Like one is learning the model, and the other is learning the weights. But I, I don't know how would that works. Uh, anyone has any addition to that? No. Do you still use parallel HPNC play with uh, generative one as well? Because 
uh, now you don't have con like with the rehearsal you had a replay buffer where you could uh -huh. but in this case you just have a, a generated model right yeah you have like a so, uh, variation of encoder or again or some sort of that. So if you look at word models, which is a paper on model based learning which uh -huh. functions like this, uh -huh. so it is modular. First you learn just from images, so you're learning the visual model. Then you only learn learn the RNN, so you only learn the dynamics. Mm -hmm. So once you have the visual part trained and the dynamics trained, then you use that for learning the policy, which is the R N part. Uh, okay, so you have uh, you actually have like three models, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then first you are generating the. And yeah, then you're supposed to generate okay. once you learn those models from. Okay, but the first two are not continuously learning; they have to learn no. everything. No. Okay. So when you say these are current approaches, are people actually implementing these things now, or is this like? Yeah. So all these are there. Are like in each bucket, there are like five or six papers in each with okay. cited on the review. So I, I actually pick up those directly from this survey. So these are how people are handling the, the continuous learning problem, which is mainly how do you handle learning a sequence of tests without forgetting the old test. So there are a few benchmarks in the field. Uh, some benchmarks are about shifting the distribution to having like non-IID distributions, and you have a kind of primitive MNIST. And the idea is that, so you're constantly learning a distribution which is shifting, and and that's the premise of machine learning is that you have an IAB distribution. So, so that's the, I think it covers the, the main issue of continuous learning. And other benchmarks are related to se sequentially learning data sets. So you can get like split and missed. So you learn from zero and one, and then you have to learn from two and three, and then from four and five, and then from six and seven. You also have the same thing for Cypher. I think it's called iCypher. Or you also have sequentially learning tasks. You have this a benchmark from, uh, this is from Vincenzo. I think he's coming here in September. And the idea of this maze is that you are navigating through a maze and suddenly at some point the maze just changes. You're still navigating and then the maze starts to change. And then you have to realize we're in a new environment and then continue learning that. And you also have uh, benchmarks which are the same test but continuous string and then I give the example of uh, this is actually one benchmark we developed here, the mental anomaly benchmark. So it's a, it's a continuous stream, but uh, you're detecting anomaly, I don't know, in one specific task. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. That's what you mean by tasks. We have lots of different domains in the benchmarks. So we have like Twitter right. streams, we have But I mean, uh, you're not data. shifting domains uh, during, you mean no, you're evaluating no, a lot of Always the same domain. The same domain, yeah. Yeah. so that's the idea of the same. So you're not shifting the distributions. But, but it's, it's a continuous. But well, the distribution shift, but the domain does. Uh, yeah. Okay, the, yeah, the sh distribution shift, but the domain does. Yeah. Um, so there are not a lot of benchmarks, and that, that's actually the main problem. So the purpose of the review is people are trying to set standards for benchmarking and reproducibility. Uh, so continuous learning is something not a lot of people have looked at in machine learning, it's not like mainstream. And there is lack of benchmarks, I would say. And some of the things they point out is you have to define those things, like how, what is the amount of prior knowledge you, you're allowed to have, what are the memory and computational constraints. Like, you can just do a model that you know keeps memory of everything, and they constantly learn from that. And that would work, but how how can you compare that to a model which doesn't keep any memory at all? So it's hard to compare both. So you have to kind of define the problem so people can actually go and tackle the problem. Uh, the amount and type of supervision you are allowed. So are you dealing with problems with all labels or do you have like a bunch of problems with no label and then some labels? And what are the performance metrics you're looking at? So in supervised learning, everybody's looking at accuracy and that's kind of the, the main thing there. But here you have to look at other things like uh, you have this, uh, how much did you forget the previous task when you learned a new task? So you, you have to define a set of metrics that work specifically for continuous learning. It's not, it's not okay just to, to measure the, the accuracy. Right? And there are a lot of limits to scaling current methods. So they can scale to 6, 10, 12, 20 tasks, but we need models to scale to 1,000 tasks. So I think this is just the beginning. And I don't know what else you probably, I put that there with some empty spots so people can also <laughs> <laughs> contribute to it. So this is mainly a, a review of the review. 
and the idea was to try to get an idea of what's going on in continuous learning, so we can uh, then uh, discuss, you know, what can we do, what are, what are possible directions, what is missing in the field. How about optimal learning by experimental design? Op optimal learning by experimental design, what do you mean by that? Well, when you're, uh, uh, if you once built a system to, to decide uh, what kind of stuff retailers ought to have, you got five colors and you got, uh, you can have saying stuff on hangers or put it on shelves and all that. So this, this, ex this, this system would help a buyer to decide what to put, to put out an optimal experiment to figure out. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, screening experiments and then they have optimizing experiments, which means there's three, there's three levels so you can get the curvature. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I actually took a, a two quarter sequence in the design and analysis of experiments. Mm -hmm. And it, you, know, you can learn a lot faster if you do optimal experimental design based on your priors and updating and all that kind of thing. So I don't know that learning is just... I, I, don't, I don't think I get it. Do you mean design your... It sounds like a, like a, a more sophisticated A-B testing, right? Like our yeah, and a way more sophisticated than A-B testing. That's the yeah. problem with A-B yeah. testing is these two things. You ought to have a whole, uh, a whole bunch of experimentation going on all the time. That's how children learn, of course, you know. They're just doing it. Put the hand up. That's all kinds of, all, so, so my, my, this mm. continuous learning, it seems to me like you know, if there's a directed learning in terms of, uh, yeah, where the most variance is, you want to put more learning uh, there and all kinds of things along. I'm just saying, what else? Uh -huh, seems yeah, to me yeah, like yeah. A, that's the kind of a, so you, you were saying it's like philosophical category or something. Think optimal task design for learning, so that's like curriculum learning. That's, it, that's a lot like curriculum learning, yeah. So it raises the question of whether we're trying, the experiments are created to learn causality, to learn causal relationships, typically. You can't learn causality without some sort of experimental Yeah. Stuff. So that's yeah. another point. All machine learning is correlational. Yeah. So there you Almost go. How do you get beyond correlational faults learning? Like superstition. See, if they did experimental design, they wouldn't have any superstition. I mean, it comes into active learning as well. You have an agent that's trying to decide what action to take and yeah. how to interpret the results of the agent. You, you can imagine an agent developing hypotheses, identifying what action is going to produce the most, do I have the most ambiguity for what I'm going to see? And that kind of ambiguity might be an indicator of I'm going to maximize my learning. Yeah. That from I'm not sure whether that gets a causality or not, but it certainly seems like you can imagine trying to optimize an agent for active experimental Active experiments, yeah, what you said is it's done a lot in active learning. Like you, you, you see, right? You see a new sample, and then how much you know, or you don't know about that new sample, then you, and you can decide whether you can use or not, or you can decide uh, what what kind of examples would drive you towards uh, better learning. Basically, what you're saying. So I think there's a lot of research that here in active learning, which is also actually there's another area called uh, optimal control. Which uh -huh. is like like it, like if That's you have good. a bunch of advertising areas and, and you have optimal advertising everywhere, that's not the optimal thing to do because you won't be learning. Uh -huh. So you should spend ten percent of your budget. There's actually a way to figure out the exact amount, but spend ten percent of your budget and you go double up and cut in half your advertising in ten percent uh -huh. of the places so that you'll learn for next time that this level of advertising wasn't optimum. So you're learning, and that actually comes at optimal. Uh, Control theory comes out of uh, 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 flight. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, so uh, optimal control is, is is the basis for reinforcement learning. I think reinforcement it, it, learning it, it, was it's, built it's on top kind of, of that. To yeah. The other thing about the testing. Yeah. And then reinforcement learning, we have this exploration exploitation dilemma, yeah. which is basically uh, you have to you always have to have a level of exploration where you're taking the wrong action, but you're taking the wrong action on purpose because on purpose. you want to explore the environment. So, uh, and I think that dilemma comes all the way from uh, optimal control. It's, uh, yeah. But you need to add those to the list. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else? You got? you got dash marks there. We need yeah. to apply more. <laughs> That's a good point. Sure. <clears throat> and the review mentioned like constraints. I thought that was very important that there should be computation and memory constraints if you're truly continuously learning. Is that your memory should be bounded by some factor. Well, is that the, 
Is that the same as the follow up air memory and not computational constraints under the? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, because, because if, if you have unlimited memory, you just can like well, keep everything and then just replay. If you have unlimited computational constraints, you can like at every transition just get everything and relearn, and then I mean, that's something go. And I think that's the more main point that they talk about is that there is not a clear definition in the field. What are the constraints? So there are a lot of like Google goes and solves the problem by just you know I'm gonna keep everything, I'm gonna run everything again, and then. Problem solved, but then Google is the only one who can solve the problem. <laughs> so that actually it might seem like it's optimal, but it doesn't work in real life. Yeah. Uh, because even if you had infinite memory and, and computational constraints, or computational capability, you still won't be able to do continuous learning well. And the reason, if you think about a continuous stream where things are constantly, you know, sensors, sensory data streaming in, and then something changes. Right. If you keep your entire buffer and you retrain over and over again, it'll be a long time before the change mm -hmm. is yeah. a significant percentage of your batch yeah. that you actually learn it. Yeah, because so the actually, distribution is shifting a lot. If, it dis if you yeah. think about it, yeah, distribution has suddenly shifted. Yeah. But if you think of this, if you still have this batch m mentality and retraining on everything over and over again, it'll take a long time before that is significantly important. Yeah. Uh, so you won't be able to react to change. Yeah, I mean, may, so. <coughs> um, maybe to add to this, if you, um, I don't know, if you have this multitask setting, then the other aspect is that, um, I mean, in your buffer, you kind of have all the tasks, right? And if you uh, train a model to do n tasks, that's usually worse on the one task you're interested in at the current time than a model that is kind of adapting to, to that one task. So that's another reason why. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you even need these, these constraints. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, ideally, a co uh, continual learner should outperform um, kind of a model that's trained on the whole data set. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Particularly if, you take, if it, particularly it's a streaming temporal yeah. scenario. Yeah. Uh, another related thing is, is the spacing of learning. You know, the, uh, there's, there's a sort of a optimal spacing. Like, if you, if you learn something and then you I mean, I'm just talking about yeah, psychologically yeah, learning yeah. yourself, you know, with flashcards or something like that. It's not best to overlearn. You want to see, you want to re, be reintroduced to something that you're just about to forget. Is that, is that, That's is that, is that a mathematical or is that really a biological issue? I, would, I, think I, it's I was, I, think I it's yeah, I always thought that was a biological issue. Um, and but, I'm not sure that would apply then. Yes, so the flashcard thing is basically what replayed us, right? So that flashcard, uh, you're saying like the Anki stuff, what the Anki stuff do is... Yeah, like yeah, Anki, yeah, exactly. exactly. So yeah, so, so you start to forget and then it shows you the flashcard. So that's basically rehearsal replay. Yeah, that's because you have exponential, exponential learning and exponential forgetting. Yeah. And you delay. Uh, but you, you don't actually, I mean, Anki cards help you, but we don't need Anki cards to remember stuff like in our lives, right? I mean, we, we can remember a lot of stuff even that happened in childhood. We can keep that skill we learned 20 years ago, even without having, you know, to do that from time to time. Like, even if I haven't, uh, I haven't skied for 20 years, but I could go and ski tomorrow, I'm sure I could do it. I mean, it's not something I would forget. So. Better than someone who's never skied. Yeah, yeah it's better than so, someone who's never skied. Yeah, so th I think there is a, Anki cards are useful, but I don't know how much uh, they are. So the, the idea of Anki cards are just like flashcards. Uh, flashcards. Yeah. Anki, it's a Japanese yeah. company that yeah. made this flashcard. So there. so it keeps track. So you, you make this deck of flashcards, and it shows you the flashcards, and you have to enter those. So it, and it keeps track of how long ago it showed you the card. Mm. So it has this curve of like your so number of days here, yeah. and this is how much you remember, and then this is how much you forget, and then you're slowly forgetting everything. And then when, when it hits like a point where it says, okay, I think now he forgot, then it's gonna show you the card again. So that's like the it optimizes your learning. Yeah, that, that's the if whole idea. If you get it right, it's gonna not ask it to you very soon. But yeah. If you got it wrong, it's gonna ask it to you pretty soon again. Pretty soon again. And then if you get it when you finally get it right, then it's not gonna ask it for a little while. So it's like a smart flashcard, you know. So yeah. it keeps track of how many days ago you last seen that. And it's I use it, I mean it's very useful, but 
we don't need it to learn, you know. I, mean, it, I don't think it's something that brings. Well, no, but it, it's more optimal to do that. If you yeah. if you space them all equally all the time, you won't learn as much as fast. This is the fastest way to learn. Is yeah. the point of it? So yeah. this usually like coin approaches, I guess, the list itself, right? Like, it's very machine learning, deep learning. Now they have people that actually know biology, and that, right? Neuroscience, right? Any hints of what actually happens in the brain so we don't have problems? There was a hint of uh, like sparkness in the, in the weights. Anything else? Uh, we actually have a lot of stuff. I think yeah. Sen yeah. Sen has a, <laughs> Sen has an entire presentation, so you're just making the introduction for Sam. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I think you could tell, I, I think maybe you have three big items, and, and I don't know if you're going to mention that. Maybe I'm forgetting some. One, we already talked about sparseness. Uh, the other thing the brain does is that its neurons are have active dendrites, so it's not all, all the synapses aren't in some people. They're grouped, and they have different grouping functions. And so um, a neuron can effectively take advantage of 30,000 synapses because it's only carrying about 20 at a time. And then the final one would be the synapses themselves are the, the way they they it's more like, um, they're not really like scalars. It's more like how uh, it, it's used as a mnemonic binary, but the, the function of them, and their, their permanence, we use the term permanence, what, when, how a synapse decides to stay around or be forgotten is a very complex function. It's not a simple thing. And it's not as simple as the Anki card, for example. So for something that was salient, when you, it's happened, you know, like you almost had a life and death experience, that one moment, that synapse could be with you for the rest of your life. Um, it biologically is different. It forms a different type of internal structure for them. And, um, and so there's, there's different methods by which synapses decide what their forgetting rate is and their learning rate is and their permanence is. It's not a simple rule that can apply continuously um, all the time. So there's three things. Right? Right, well, and well, Are you going to talk about well, that stuff? Uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. yeah I, I didn't know who exactly the scope of the audience was, so it's oh, a little bit broad, and a little, I'll give it brief. That's good. But I think it should address that. I think there's some interesting things about that. I think, overall, you have to say that there are some principles, and uh, I think even these papers we discuss, everyone is, a, a, lot, a lot of these papers are somehow looking at the brain, like, they do our architecture, they were, they were doing that based on the research that now, is discredited, but at the time was not. That the hippocampus was like transferring information to, to the neural context somehow. So, and the elastic weight consolidation is, uh, is also uh, inspired in the same thing. So, a lot of this research is if you actually read the paper, there is like half a page or even a full page making relations to neuroscience. So, I know, you know, as I was listening to this, I was thinking about if you do accept sparsity and you have some of the advantage of that, then the idea that um, synaptics synaptic effect efficacy or weight could be a more complex function. You might have a more, there could be parameters associated with the synapse in a deep learning network. I'm wondering if that would be helpful, because those things do exist in the brain. So as you're going through here deciding what to forget and what to learn, just the, just the general idea that synapses could have multiple sort of parameters that dictate when you, this guy should be forgetting or this guy should be more permanent. Um, like synapse might, types? Well, it's it's more of this. It would be like think, another thing associated with this. Yeah, I mean, right now, I, I, yeah, it's fair. Right now, I I think in all these deep learning networks, there's some rule that is applied over and over again to increase or decrease the weight, and right. that same rule is applied to every synapse. That's right, it. Right. But and and then the way yeah, brain does it, there's multiple rules. It's like you know, it's not a single rule that, as I said, you know, a, um, a saliency thing. You could say I'm immune to the decay. You know, right. I have a different state. Uh, I have a different parameter that says I should be remembered longer than anybody else or very long because this was an important thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just that you're going from a single, a single rule applied to synaptic weights to maybe a more complex function. I don't even know what that would be, that function in these networks. Well, but we have some sort of that uh, applied to sequence learning. I mean, LSTMs work a little bit like that. So LSTMs, you have, uh, you have a forget gate and you have, uh, so you have a gate that yeah. tells you how much of the new input you're going to accept. 
and you have a gate that tells you how much you should forget about what you have, and a gate that tells you how much of the new thing you should uh, keep for later. So you have these three different rules going on in LSTMs. And so the idea, so LSTMs you have like this kind of complex cell. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean, the, the dynamic pruning stuff that you've been looking at with set? Yeah, or as an example of this, the you dynamic you pruning will also be so you ha we would have like the gradient, uh, gradient descent, uh, updating the weights, and then we have a second rule deciding which connections to keep. That that would be a way of doing that as well. But I, I think that's a, actually a nice research direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should have like several rules. I mean, I wonder the whole, the whole idea of, uh, of saliency, which is a prominent theme in brain theory. Oh, what is it? Saliency, how salient it means is how important it is, or its, it's significance. Uh -huh. So when you go through these uh, these benchmarks, I think that there isn't any concept of you know some patterns are more important to know than others. I, is, is there? I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. No. Um, but in the real world, that's the case, mm -hmm. and some errors are more damaging than other errors. And uh, so from a practical implementations point of view, from a, a, a real system that's doing something, um, that might be useful. I don't know. It seems like if you fed back, like if you had a prediction that wasn't good and there was a high cost to that, yeah. like I almost got hit by a car, okay, yeah. that I'm really going to remember. Yes. So it seems like you have some kind of feedback that sort of gives you a cost, and then that yeah. thing that you didn't remember, that new synapses that you formed, like that's going to have a really high permanence. Yeah. Yeah. or something like that, some yeah. kind of VIP. The way staff. you might think about this in the brain, with a lot of this occurs through this sort of, these release of these neuromodulators. Uh, so you have all these synapses, rules are being updated, but when something bad happens or something good happens, it sort of floods the, the neocortex with a chemical, mm -hmm. which says, okay, you all guys, you're doing reinforcement learning, but this is really important, so <laughs> you, know, you guys are gonna stick around uh, and not be forgotten. I mean, that's how it works in the brain, just sort of a, but it has that sort of, the salience is like, oh, this was important, I almost yeah. got killed. Yeah, so then that's, we don't have that in applied HTM right now. We just, it's just sequences. It's just no, we don't have that, but, but when we did the synapse permanence in HTM, yeah. the concept, that was the beginning of a more complex right. learning function for synapses. Yeah. No. So this elastic weight consolidation tries to do that, where um, how they decide is how important is this neuron for the output. And if one particular neuron is more important than say the other, it slows down the learning on that. Mm. That's one way where you decide based on the neuron activity and how mm. the network, what the network That's happens. more of an internal metric of the, yeah. of the network. But what you're talking about is you're re uh, attaching weights to data, like it's on the... Yeah, it's more of an application-specific yeah. yeah. issue, right? If you're doing a self-driving car or, mm -hmm. or you're doing you know, detecting cancer or whatever like that, you know, certain errors are more important than others. Yeah, so that's to the data set. Yeah. Like, what you're learning is decided versus what the network is. Two different ways of Yeah, like the weighted loss yeah, functions. Yeah. But, but our brain gives that, like, uh, I assume, like, as you mentioned, like in that situation, it must have those internal mechanisms yeah, where it's, it's assigning weight to the experience. Right? Mm -hmm. But if, if you take a normal supervised learning, how do you know which examples are like more important? Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you, in most of the world, you don't know that, right? So most of the times, you don't do that. So is there sort of a dichotomy between prediction errors and reward prediction errors? It seems like in reinforcement learning, mm -hmm. the primary signal is the reward Yeah, so, so in, part, in uh, reinforcement learning, we do that. We use this DDR to decide which experience to throw out or to keep in the replay buffer. So you use this DDR as a measure. But it's different from what Jeff's saying, because what Jeff's saying is that you only see that once, and you know that one time that you should never forget that. You should never forget the flying words. <laughs> so I don't know if you have, you, you don't have that even with problem. It would be like, you have the TDR, like measure surprise, but then it's, you have to use that somehow to determine that your neural network should never forget that. But then you should, you need to add some kind of method. I don't know. Well, I, yeah, it, it's more of a practical, application-specific type of thing. But I think, I don't know, I just, if I was thinking about deep learning neural networks and brains, it's one of the fundamental differences in the whole the substrate of learning is that the, the synaptic efficacy or weight, if you want to call it that, is a much more complex function. Okay. So, just a thought. Well, you need to have a mapping like there is an HTM between this part of the data distribution is sort of, is sort of, uh, is the receptive field of this part of the network. So a certain 
memory or a certain event sort of has somewhere that it lives in the network locally. Well, the, it's as just opposed to everywhere. Uh, yes, so right. You know yeah, yeah. Well, that's, but that's why I said I preface my comment that it has to be a sort of sparse implementation. Right. Because when you have that's a sparse right. implementation, yeah. you can do that. The synapses are shared to some extent, but not nearly as much. Right, and you can like create a new synapse and say never touch that synapse. <laughs> You're yeah. never going to yeah. forget that. Yeah. yeah. So when you have a sparsity, then all of a sudden you, 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 you know, the not every synapse is participating, and not every neuron is participating in everything. Right. Yeah. Participating, yeah. right? And then you can start doing these kind of things. So it really it's tied into the sparsity issue yeah. as well. Perfect. Yeah. Um, any other uh, inputs before we move to Sam? Is there anything from biology and the HTML world that I think about sort of the, the implicit um, current approach of the genetic architecture is just the use of hierarchy? Uh, maybe related to what Bruno was doing with creating contexts or maps, but uh, it seems unclear that you actually need a mask if you have repeated network flowing predictions from a hierarchical network um, that are producing some sort of top down bias that allow for certain. Uh, certain you mean like to have a, a top network and a top network produce some bias for the lower network? Yeah. Oh, so you mean like to have a high hierarchy of networks yeah. and then the top one producing bias for the other one? Yeah, so we're doing downward flowing predictions, Bayesian brain style or HGM style, um, and those predictions are biasing the inputs, uh -huh. um, and therefore different subsets of the network are active based on the context. So the, the top layer has to learn some sort of context, and then that can essentially mask. But it seems like um, as an approach like masking is really going even too far, maybe. It seems like all you really need is um, downward flowing connections. The apical ones. Yeah, apical yeah. inputs, whatever. I don't know, but yeah, that's true. Oh, that, that, that's a good I was going to actually ask that. And anyone who knows about the brain <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> can give a uh, put on that. Like, it's a good time. Do you think there is something the brain is doing that, or Marcus, that we should somehow consider here? I think we covered a lot of that already you know, with the sparsity. I think to add to what Jeff was saying, Another thing is just the way that the learning rules work have to exploit sparsity and the and the way these permanent values work. So it's um, and so I think that's something you can perhaps learn something about how from the brain and how it works. So if you really exploit sparsity in your learning algorithm, you can learn continuously in a very kind of localized way without forgetting the old stuff. or further down the multiple, the de uh, detecting distributional shifts. Um, there's, there's definitely plenty of um, interesting results indicating that like the brain has like these kind of mode switches. Like it'll be in one mode and then it jumps into another mode. One policy, then another policy. Uh, 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 the, idea, and the idea that you can kind of is that, is that a bit like Jeremy was saying? Like, you, when you jump into another policy, you're introducing some prior to Yeah, yeah. So you, is that what you're saying there? And I, mean, I can imagine a top down modulating effect to the change of the policy. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the idea that you can have these different policies or different modes, and they don't really interfere with each other very much, uh, which is compatible with the idea of like sparsity. Uh, uh, but um, the, uh, this is a vague answer, but it's just that. There definitely does seem to be some of that in the brain where, where it can kind of jump between modes in a sense. And so the, the Bruno's paper is more or less built on that idea. So you have this context, and then you apply this context to it, and then what you get up, out of it is like a new network. And then you can have the same network learn several different things. You just need those different contexts. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think he's coming from the same idea you are. Like you can modulate. Somehow you are constantly shifting domains in your head. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. So and then we kind of well, the sparsity thing provides one theory for how those domains avoid stomping all over each other. Yeah, and you still can do a lot of things with the same. Yeah. Cool. I think on the replay as well, on the rehearsal and um, generative replay, these things are are happening during sleep, which is something we you know, obviously is not incorporating into machine learning models yet. Um, and just in general, so the consolidation, consolidation. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, we have this default mode network that shows up in neuroscience between tasks and fMRI scanner. So it's just this activity that's going on when you're not asking asked to do something. The default network is associated with um, kind of memory and, uh, and replay of past experience, as well as prospection or generation of future possible episodes. Mm -hmm. And so you know, there's replay happening. It's while we're not doing anything, you mean? Like, you know, there's, there's not task-directed activity, which is, some, uh, there's some say that show like a third of our time is spent essentially in this kind of like- This is when you're awake, not when you're sleeping, when you're awake. It's a, a lot harder to know what's happening when you're sleeping. Because but the, but but you're talking, when you're awake. Yeah. You're talking about when you're awake. Yeah, yeah. How is that different than just thinking about stuff? Exactly. How do you know this? <laughs> <laughs> it is very much thinking about stuff. Okay, it is thinking about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, even while I'm listening to it, look, it's my brain, and my brain's yeah, flung, yeah. going around, doing all the different types of things. Oh, what am I going to do tonight? Blah, blah, blah. Tomorrow, where's my wife? Blah, blah, blah. You know, all these things are going on. So um, I, I guess you could call that replay, I guess, or rehearsal. Or, you're, know, like, you're like engaging in a simulated world yeah, when you're not yeah, engaging in the yeah, actual yeah. world. Yeah. Why is it hard to measure in sleep? Well, uh, you just can't remember the subjective experience of sleep. You can remember that from my sleep for sure. And I think that, uh, I forget whether the default mode network is active in sleep, but I think there are some parallels there. Yeah, I mean, the so, so the consolidation phase and in sleep is much. So, so I, I I guess the main um, the main difference between this default mode network and the um, replay kind of that's happening in sleep is that you can actually measure the so 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 let's say you are awake and you are learning the motor activity. And you're measuring some correlates of, of that uh, while it's performing that motor activity. Then the night, uh, th then kind of the night um, afterwards, you can measure these same correlates um, yeah. at least in, in some brain regions. Um, while the default mode network is not associated to any, at, at least as far as I know, so it's not related to a particular motor activity. And moreover, if you kind of perturb that activity during sleep then the learning will be affected. So if you train a mouse today on something and perturb the consolidation phase, mm -hmm. then it won't have that, have that motor memory in the next day. So but that, that consolidation phase is just going on in the neocortex, right? That the neocortex alone? Uh, I mean, it's hard to know whether these are, and I don't think anyone's got a definitive answer to this, and that some, like the, the role of sleep. Is that a theoretically important thing, or is it just a biologically important thing? You know, is it is it just you know, brain cells have to do that because of you know the way proteins are you know created? <laughs> Who knows what? So, I mean, uh, it's, it's so much of our data we spend in sleep. You imagine evolution has found some way to utilize aspects of it. <laughs> well, I, mean, I guess the question is, do we have? Is it, is it important that we, will we in the future will our AI systems have sleep, need to sleep, need to sleep or not. I mean, at the moment we have the work we do here in the Mendo, we, uh, we don't know, we don't know any reason why we have to, we, we haven't thought of any reason, we're not going to do it. You know? We know the re replay is useful, so it may, it may not be human looking in sleep. It's not yeah. going to be. But there's, but we just heard you, you said there's replay during the day too, so yeah, yeah, um, yeah. why sleep, you know? I thought the latest thing on that was everywhere else you have your lymph system to clean out all the, all the stuff out of you. But in your brain, you know, it's floating that, and that when you sleep, it, that, that, that cleaning goes on. <laughs> it's in your brain. Is that right? Oh, yeah, it washes right. your brain. So that's a non. That's that's a that's a period of bio, That's yes. not a, Yeah. I think that paper was contested a bit. Yeah. You know, another thing is, is it, your brain. Learning, <laughs> versus, <laughs> learning versus recall. You know, and and recalling things, sequential things is a lot harder than recalling uh, with prompt, you know, associative recall versus uh, versus uh, free recall, I guess mm -hmm. is what they call it. But when you say sequential, I mean recall. sequential is, a, is in some sense auto-associative, right? You, an element invokes the next element, invokes the next element. Um, I mean, it's funny because you say that sequential recall is, I mean, I always think of sequential recall as a, as a Associated Well, no, but when, but, it, but, but but you only. Uh, that, it's like it's like I'm trying to recall a melody. I won't maybe. just recall a melody. But once I, if you want to, you know, yeah. just recall all my melodies, I know I won't be able to do that very well. But if I start hearing a melody, then that, that one will play out. You know, so it's a bit of both, right? Once you get something started. What do you mean, like across features? Like if you see X is one thing, it'll cheat. Well, I'm thinking more of like these guys that learn pigs, and then they then they, and they, you, you, you tell them ten, tell you ten things, and you can't remember three of them. You know, 
that somebody that has learned tags, they do it associatively, and so then they can remember them all because they're they're going to be. What's tags? tags? Pegs are our mental uh, mental sequence that you have memorized, and then when somebody tells you a list of things, you you like you have it in different places in your house. Oh, that's the uh, that's method of low code. Those are the the pegs. method of low code. That's what the term we. we oh, okay, use. yeah, low code. That that goes right into since our, our our theory of object modeling and representation. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, in our in our current work here, and again, I want to go. Is that on the board up there someplace? No, no. 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 This is machine learning. Yeah, yeah that's the state of our machine. But learning. does machine learning it gets to avoid that? I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it tends to deal with whatever it is. <laughs> 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 so that's the whole thing. Let's ask it. Sam, do you wanna? Uh, yeah, so sure. uh, briefly, yeah. did, did you have a project? Did you want to project? Uh, I thought so. I wasn't sure what the setup was. I just have. No, you can project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, how should I? Because yeah, this is. You guys want to move? Uh, here. Oh, I know over there. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I'll just, I'll just turn the camera around. I'm not really. <laughs> we're, we're, we're flexible here. Okay, come on, guys. Green, so it's in the light I'm gonna see. Right yeah. Here. Who the target audience was?
change the tax. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The tax is constantly, you know, more. Yeah. Some people will fight against it, though. So, so anyways, this is just, this is one instance. This is a product that I've uh, listed. But, um, but yeah, and the, the results are actually pretty promising. It's a limited amount of data. Um, and so this is, this is just one instance that I've worked with where I really wanted something that was continuous learning. And it didn't work. Okay. And then there's, there's a field of continuous authentication that's very active right now. Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. answer. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
couple different things. So it's not like you know you could actually pick apart out of forty people and not be you know making a lot of things. So okay, so this is just a turning problem. And now I wanted to hear so for some people this is a great one. Uh, some people other you know, um, so for those who are not super familiar with HTML theory, I just wanted to give a basic like sort of a thumbnail shot of it as best I could. Just the basic idea that um, uh, you have, there's a, a, we're in Mount Castle, um, a neuroscientist from 40 years ago or so, kind of um, that he basically had the idea that if you look across the neocortex, and if you look at the, uh, the parts that are responsible for vision, for touch, for these different things, there's a lot of, uh, he believed, and it's been well supported, that there's a lot of commonality to the structure there. So uh, it suggests the idea that there is some common mechanism circuit that's being replicated across the brain and it's being implemented kind of regardless of what you learn, um, which is really profound, I think. So that's like a premise of, of HTM to begin with as like its founding thing, not like we want to be good at anomaly detection, like we want to know about this thing that's running all over the world. So just, again, just, just to give you a, a bird's eye view, this is good stuff. So obviously this is the brain. This represents the neocortex, which is the outer layer of the brain. So it's a flat sheet. If you were to find it out, it'd be like a sheet. Um, and there's so it goes down in the cracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not actually laying over the top. No, right, right. No, it's, it's uh, yes, of course. But it's I like think if you were to theoretically flat out flat, it would, you know, <laughs> it would be flat like this. Um, there is a clear presence of hierarchy. So you have, um, if you basically look at the topological Topological connectivity across the overall system is a sense of hierarchy. Some of you know much better, I won't go more into it than that. When I talk about uh, HTM, which the, the actual algorithm as it is an application that, that, is, that I used at least, um, it is happening on this level, um, which is the level of um, one layer of one column. So there's a lot, I'm not going to go into it. There's more, you know, see the recent stuff about columns, but this initial thing is literally just. It's taking like a, it's like one Lego, you know, out of the castle. You know, it's like, a, it's like sort of one module that in and of itself is one thing that you can not from anything. Um, so, so yeah, so you'll, you'll see how the, uh, the, the neurons sort of conduct the learning. So this is just to give an overall sense of HTM theory, one, a little bit outdated picture, and then, yeah. Now what's a, what's a mini column? Yeah. As opposed to a, a column column? Okay. Um, I, okay, here's what we'll do. I, I want to go through and you'll see what, what I mean by, by mini columns, and then we can get into that. There's a lot on that, and I feel like I don't want to drag everybody down more of a record. So you watch stage tips for it's in there? <laughs> <laughs> so for now, <laughs> I just, for, now, for now, we're talking about this, as I'm going to say, it's about mini columns, but we can talk about columns okay. later as well. Okay, cool. So again, just for those who are not familiar, very quickly, um, this just shows the idea of what um, so, if you look at these two different sequences, right, two different time series symbol sequences, A, B, C, D here, and X, B, C, Y, what we see is that in this, in this total space, you have different parts of the, in, different parts of the space that are allocated to different potential inputs within the distribution. So this is categorical, right? So here, you have, when you see A, these columns activate. So whenever you see A, only those columns will activate. When you see B, these different columns are activated, right? So only these columns and only these neurons are involved in the representation of B, not all of them, just these ones. C, it's these ones and B, so on. So now, these are not uh, exclusive, right? Any particular column can participate in different patterns, but the, yeah. the grouping is always very easy. Yes. So you're not limited to the capacity. Right, right. And there's a Right, right. This is this is yeah, this is a very, very small thing just to show that there are numerous columns that will activate to represent certain essentially spatial features, spatial features. So here, so this is a really important part of it, um, that makes it distinct as far as I'm aware. Um, so we have two different instances of B and two different instances of C, right? A, B, C, D, X, B, C, Y. Right? So B and C are the same, right? So we have a representation here that that uses the same 
columns because it's a B, right? It uses the same columns here as here, but it's a C. But because the context is different, it picks a different cell in each column. So there you have basically done spatial and temporal feature detection at once in a really sparse space without having the patterns all over each other, right? Because you can separate, you can recognize that this is the same as this, but it's also different at the same time. So this is like that, that separating out of information and memory space. This is what, to me, I think is really sort of going up the multiple subcontinent design. And we're using these dropouts and regularizations to kind of get around that problem. You know, but this like this architecture by its nature is not that So this is just a core core HDM concept for anybody out there who's not already familiar. Okay, moving on. All right. Just a little bit more of a tangible example here. Pretty much similar to the last thing. So two different sequences, right? But they both share common common uh, inputs here. We're treating these like categories basically now. So here, right, you have E double prime and E prime, right? Again, same columns, different neurons to represent them. So you can see that this is the same but different. Again, here many, right? Also um, the same thing, different columns. And then cakes and pies, these are two different things. So they have a totally different set of columns. So we can separate, but we can separate two many the same way we can separate, not exactly the same way, but essentially the same way we can separate. All right, so. Right, and then the learning, so this very, very quickly concept, is the heavy style learning, right? So as opposed to having a system where you have a lot of initialized weights that you just change around a lot, and that, that can be work super great. Um, but here, if you start and start with no, uh, no synapses formed in the very beginning, if I'm, please correct me if I'm wrong anywhere, right? You start empty, right? And you form synapses as you need to in order to represent sequences that you've seen. So at first, you're surprised by everything. Right? And the more surprised you are, the more learning you do. Um, so here, this cell right, learns to connect to some subset of the cells that were active before, and it does that by itself. It's not looking at a master error signal from somewhere. It does it by itself. It connects. And each of these connections is actually modulated in their own right on their own merits, instead of having one error signal. That you can them. So, so those, each cells connect to those girl cells. These men, sorry, and boy cells. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so these many cells connect specifically to these each cells, and I think this is this sort of exemplifies the real power of the system because you can have essentially Markov property one, right? All these cells are only connecting to one step prior, but because these cells before contain specific contextual information, that allows it to kind of remember everything else in that form without having to actually remember. This is another thing that I can see you can learn, something like this, where you can, you know, make have a simple short learning mechanism that has a far reach without making complicated time. Far reach in time. Yes, yes, a far, a far reach in time. A far reach in time. So at a given point, we're talking before, it's like if you took if you kept the whole buffer, then oh you're not gonna be able to adapt that. But it's like if you think about animals, like we're always using the whole history, we're always deciding which parts of the history are relevant for right now. You know, so there's not a strict limit. So, so, so maybe follow up question. So, in, in what sense would, would that system, um, let's say, have a, I don't know, a music piece, right? Yeah. Where kind of the ending and the beginning have some sort of relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know. So that would be a um, couple of hundred thousand audio samples. Right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, would, would would that system have actually? A, um, I mean, this this is, seems quite low to me, right? Yes. Or, yeah, it's because it's, yeah. so. So, so in, in, in what sense are you are you able to track long term relationships with that scheme? Yeah. So okay. So long, long term relationships. So this is like where if you have you know a causing event and then a hundred other things and then the effect. Yeah. Right. It's hard. So so here. So this or, is. Or are you saying like the music? Um, I'm tracking. Sometimes you, there's two questions. One is you, you have some event, you have a lot of jump in between, and then you have another event. And mm -hmm. the other is you have a very long sequence of events, like a melody. Right, 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 right. And you want to keep track of the whole melody. Yeah. This is the second one. I think it's talking about the first one. Okay. But yeah. So, right, so in, the, right, in that case where you have a long term dependency, then it's. So this will naturally just look at each event as it comes. So, if that, so that largely depends on the data. Um, but theoretically, if you have a really big, 
if you have a big gap between things, then it will learn to eventually connect those things depending on the sort of like what else goes on in between. But if it's a long gap, it should feel like it's like longer to learn that, to learn that relationship. But like the, the way that it stores a lot of information over time is like like here, this is such a specific instance, contextual instance of many, that has learned to connect to such a specific contextual instance of heat that this these cells are going to be very rarely um, engaged. They're going to rarely activate. They're going to rarely be adjusted. But the memory is living there in that place because of the connections that can form. So they can be re-engaged at any time. So if you learn some patterns initially, learn some other patterns, and it's been forever, instead of worrying about, oh, am I still going to know those first patterns, they're there, right? I mean, you can do, there is, depending, you can put in, put in the for a minute, and you can forget it. There's a lot of overlap if it's overwritten. But, but you're generally, you know, if you have one kind of pattern or another kind of pattern, you know that they used to live in their own place. And so you could keep them open up and network and say, okay, so I wanted to get this idea across. All right. Um, okay, same thing, right? So these connect to many, and these connect to this many. So you can see how that would cause there to be numerous possible predictions. Because if you just said eat and many without the context of boys eat or girls eat, then it's not going to know to only activate these or to only activate these. It's going to activate all of them, which is going to make all of these predictive. So you get numerous predictions. Which is possible because it's fun. Okay. Or you get however many predictions are relevant based on the context. So you don't have to say, give me two predictions, give me one prediction, give me 10 steps back, give me three steps back. It's all the natural thing. Okay. All right. And just very quickly, so um, this is kind of the, the core, core difference that I think um, one of the main things that's like really, really key to understand um, is that when we talk about like neurons and synapses, like the nature of what a neuron is and what a neuron does and what the role of a neuron is in the system is sort of like it is different and sort of approached differently than you would get in the usual like in a multi-way perception type system. It's almost a little bit more Markovian in style in the sense that it represents an element type onto itself rather than part of a mapping between input and output. Um, so yeah, okay. basically um, it's it's like it's like how Jeff has said, where you where you have um, you have these uh, these active dendrites that, that um, they pull into groups, which are these segments. So it basically is to get at the point where this cell structure allows for really early high capacity learning to learn to be involved in many different patterns potentially. So it makes like the system investigate. Okay. Well individuals, one way to phrase it, individual neurons can reliably respond to hundreds of patterns. Almost no interference or overlap or could that mm -hmm. And that would, how hard would that be to do with like a deep learning model? You know, to have, to have. Because, yeah, like it's, to me, like this makes all the difference. Like if you're over there, like you can do all the, you can do a lot of really cool things to optimize and fill the gaps, but it's like, this makes it so All right, um, almost done. Okay, so this is just to show the idea again, more stuff. Just to show, and on the point of continuous learning as well, that um, this same system, the same uh, uh, algorithm using the same hyperparameters has been successfully applied across domain. Um, so they initiated one model, put it over here, good. Initiated another model, carbon copy, put it over here, did good, same thing. Um, and to me, I just think that I don't see how this is possible without I mean, I suppose it, it could be. Um, but but I think this is this is a function. Right, and I think that is actually all for now. So, I don't know, we, we talked about this a little bit. This is like a, a more condensed version of what we are talking about. Um, getting continuous learning into NLP based models, so we talked about this, but usually it's it's something to do with, as we just said earlier, um, making the networks bigger to create more space to represent more things. But that creates problems because there's more layers to see through. Doing replay, right? Holding on to all data and re-showing it, but that creates more arbitrary parameters on which data you hold on to. Why that data for how long? Unrealistic biologically. Things that are kind of unsatisfying. <laughs> and then um, using non-overlapping encoding, so like trying to like inject sparsity or create something where um, you know basically not all the neurons and not all the synapses are involved in everything. So it's kind of like 
creating some breathing in the space, basically. Um, you know, some of these, it's like, it's like the traits that they're trying to create by doing this, I see in uh, sort of and, and, you know, uh, So, okay. And that, I think, is it. Okay. Oh, you book. Yes, well, I have a, I took out the slide with the, the scoring thing, but it, it did well. It did well. There was one specialized algorithm that outperformed it, but it did well, and it did well across different parameters. It, it, it was good. So, anyways, the idea of that was just like give an overview and like spark a discussion that we kind of already had, so it's a little bit on. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, thanks, guys. Yeah, go ahead, um, So, in, in, in terms of continuing learning in your HTML, yeah. So, the sort of continued learning you're doing is adapting to the distribution shift, right? So, if the input data changes, you... Right, so, so like, at any given point, so, like, at any given point, there's some input, and if, unless it's completely new, or it's a very young system, basically, it will generate some level of predicted self, basically, some predicted activity to happen. And then when the new input comes in, basically, the, the, the parts of the space that showed up unpredicted do the learning and the parts that were predicted don't. So if you have essentially more predicted, like more periodicity and you know more predictability, then you'll have structures that kind of like codify, like essentially dendrite right segments that sort of like become strong and codify, and you don't need that many. But if you have more complex patterns, longer patterns, more noise, you'll fill up more of the space. So the continuous learning is very often growing new synapses to represent new things, but also um, uh, basically uh, forming and unforming is it existing synapses. Yeah, but so, so let's say this GPS task, for example. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's the actual task to predict the trajectory in the future? Or? So, the, so the actual, so the GPS sensor, that was actually um, an anomaly detection test um, where they were looking at um, uh, the movement of, was it trucks? Ships. Ships, ships and harbors. Ships and harbors, right. And so, um, Sort of like sorry, of learning the sort of learning the movements of these ships, um, and then uh, when the ships show a new behavior, let's say at first that would be that would raise anomalies for us, just like we weren't expecting it. But then if that new behavior persisted in any way, then those anomalies scores would come down, and you would see that this is sort of this is sort of uh, that task was simply to look to in one of the many many ships in many harbors and just have some machine fly which ships are acting on the and, uh, and so they they were just trained on these real ships, what they did, and and as, as the ships changed their patterns, it would continuously modify the model for them. Mm -hmm. And so what applies one month and not apply one month. Yeah, yeah, I mean it seems like anytime you want to model like like be modeling any sort of living system, a system that's connected to a living system, like ships or something not living with people are driving. And then we are naturally periodic in the ways that we are, and also naturally noisy in the ways that we are. So it's, it seems like if you're going to, in those kind of cases, continuous learning just seems like you need it. The anomaly detection is periodic because, let's say, the one part of the harbor is closed off for a dredge at some point. Mm -hmm. You should avoid that, and also you have some anomaly. Right. But then you don't want to continue to have this anomaly because that's the new norm. The new norm. So right. very quickly, it will continue to know, but everyone's avoiding that. Or unless, right, you have to have something that triggers and say, oh, uh, there's been a lot of anomalies, that must mean that there's a distribution shift, so I guess we should restart now. Yeah. Like, right, in order to not have that problem, yeah. that would be a problem. So yeah. one of the interesting things about that is when they're done dredging the harbor and the ships go back to their previous pattern, the anomalies aren't thrown anymore. So there's no forgetting of the previous pattern. No, they're, still the, the they're still there, those scenarios are still there. While it is, it's a very slow forgetting. Yeah, so they can you, forget. You, you yeah. forget it. You, you have a, a friend with a slow forgetting, for, but you know, it's a, it's a year or something. And stuff, you know, yeah. Could, yeah. But in general, you are. In general, you say, yeah, that's, I knew that. that was, I knew to get that because I went to I do the same thing with like song examples. Like I'll play a melody, a melody over and over, and change one of the notes, and you can immediately see first thing occurring, and then, you know, only just goes up, and then. But after a few times, it's like okay, no, no big deal. It's got it's established the new the new segments, the new connections, and then as soon as you go back, it's like oh, that's normal. Too. You know, it's, it's, it's normal. Right. Yeah. Depending on the on the, the permanent value. Yeah. yeah, and you can twiddle all these things. You know, you can 
said it took pretty really fast, but it's for one child on, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 to me, it seems like this is like the, the objective of the mental really of, of this approach is like we want to. We're going, we're starting with the idea of, of trying to do brain like things and then sort of like sort of arrive at this certain structure and then sort of said, like, oh, this could be applied to machine learning. Rather than saying, like, we want to do something well in machine learning, that's like common. That was reminded of, I think, Brain Debate, talking a little bit. Yeah, Brain yeah. 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 Debate is about machine learning. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, um, yeah. um, and how to improve machine learning. Yeah. Not just the kind of the It's just the yeah. So, so I guess so I'll stop here. And I guess just, just really quick, because I guess this is the first day of the group that I'm on this organizer. Um, I guess to me, like maybe we each have our own like thing that we're looking to get out of this or like how we wanna what we're sort of like coming here for to think about. Like to me personally, it's like the just like, like I think that um, uh, neural architectures and like neural and adaptive, you know, nature constrained computing and, um, you know, obviously is like potentially really powerful and I think is the way that we're going to get to AI that we don't have now because it's not smart enough, basically. It's not adaptive enough. It can't understand the world well enough. So I want to see where can we use uh, what to me are just any neural structure, any structures that would work. I think there's a lot of kind of physics, obviously. But, you know, any neural structures that work. And look at it from what does this offer us? What does this enable us to do that it's often hard in machine learning to do? Because we can, we can understand the theory enough to say, oh, that's why it's hard. That's like, how do we get around it? At more level, you know, or you know, what? Um, you know, so that's like my tack at all of this. So we all have our own thing. I'm excited for this group thing. Everybody for coming today. Yeah, thanks, thanks to Jeff and to the tower. Yeah, well, thanks, everybody. Nice to meet you. Ah, yeah, thanks, nice. Yeah, it was pretty great. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So. And yeah, thanks to Lucas and Sam for organizing and helping with the idea. I didn't do anything. We're always doing a lot of streaming. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I hope we can. Yeah, I want everybody to come with ideas. So, what happens next? What is the. Not next, it's just doing. Oh, no, I meant the next. Next, next, next. Next video. He's just worrying about his beer. So, next meeting is on. Short term of time. I think it's on about, <laughs> about sparsity. Yeah. Oh, sparsity. Okay. Yeah. Next one. So we have this idea of having a federal topic, but we thought it was I suggested to talk about sparsity. I mean, if some of you guys want to go in. So we're just starting on I think today people, I, think, I don't know if they had a high time right now. But they had like a full RSMP and then they did some very good news. But not a lot of people came. Did you find it hard to find out? I think a lot of meetups are like that. Was it hard to find out? Next time, next time. Yeah, next time we just don't, we kind of restrict it to 25 and then a lot of people leave it. Yeah, I think maybe we restrict it to more than that. Yeah, we hope to do it. Everybody say, I want everybody to, to feel free to say what they want to think about, what they want to talk about, what they want to get out of this or work for. It seems like there might, I thought maybe there might be a little bit of a natural uh, clustering to some, maybe some people who want to be a little bit focused, you know, depending on people who cluster a little bit around certain focuses, you got like sub collaborations, depending. I don't know, I just want everybody to feel like they can just like totally like say what they want to get out of it and then see who method like it was and we'll adapt. So, we're the organizers, but this is what we can feel that they feel on the rest of the Yeah. Yeah. So, the next one is next month, right? Is next month? Next month, yeah. Second Wednesday. All right. I don't know. But yeah, second Wednesday. All right. And, uh, I don't know, whoever's not on the discussion forum, yeah, that's the way that we all communicate. Just in case we're in the middle of the middle. We all communicate. Uh, we have a slide. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. If you have something, if you're working in the area of continuous learning and you're working on something and you want to present it, this would be a friendly place to present your work. 
I think you are. Sure, yeah, I'm talking to them, so why not? Yeah. <laughs> but you have to come here. <laughs> like, we're not going to do it properly. I think I have to get the I think you briefly mentioned one thing, which was um, maybe this not something you're working on, but you mentioned this idea of the very low resolution computing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's something that's inherent in the brain as well. Yeah. It's not super. Yeah. We don't that's have 30 bit floating points. Yeah. yeah. So that would be, I don't know if it's exactly tied to sparsity, but that's almost like it's own. Just the paper review too. That's interesting, yeah, yeah. and we don't have to live stream it. But it's just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we kind of predicted. I mean, it's very cool. We want to live stream, but we kind of predicted Curious about sort of hardware architectures around sparsity as well, and, you know, and GPUs and oh, well, new sparsity and GPUs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's going to be on sparse. And now we have the yeah. That's great. Is there anything that was, I guess, is on the meetup page where people could sort of go, like sort of like a, you know, how we can have people come and add something to the whiteboard and kind of like do that? If, if it wasn't, if she decided this like in two days instead of right now. So there is this lag. Yeah, we can, we can right, just say, hey, I want to. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, How many people are on this left already? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't know about the video. I think that's our advertisement of this. Um, <laughs> well, you can send a message to a, the whole meetup group. Okay. And, like, through right. email. It sends okay. everyone an email. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna turn live stream off. It's pretty much it's pretty degraded at this point because yeah. when I moved everything, like half the connections came out. <laughs> uh, yeah, fourteen. So, bye guys. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Stay tuned for something else.